Good morning. Good morning. Our first reading today is from Isaiah chapter 43, verses 16 through 21, and it's found on page 717 of your Pew Bible. Thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings forth chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise, they are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing, now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild beasts will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, that they might declare my praise. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm today is Psalm 126, and we'll read responsively. And it's found on page 613. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter, and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the naked. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 14, and it's found on page 1166. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever game, gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus had made me, has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Please rise for the gospel. The gospel according to St. Luke in the 20th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. One day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and scribes with the elders came up and said to him, Tell us by what authority you do these things, or who is it, or who it is that gave you this authority? He answered them, I also will ask you a question. Tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say, from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say, from man, all the people will stone us to death, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered and said that they didn't know where it came from. 
And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let let it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant, and they also beat and treated him shamefully, and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third. This one they also wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him, so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, Surely not. But when he looked directly at it, when he looked directly at him and said, What then? Is this that is written, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Kids may come forward. Let's open this morning in prayer. Gracious Father, thank you, Lord, for all that you've given to us. The sun, food, homes, health, our very lives. Thank you for sending your son. And thank you for all that he did for us on that cross. Bless our our time of worship this morning. May the words of my mouth and meditations of all of our hearts Be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, our our Lord and our rock. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're going to begin this morning with a quiz. Now, most of us have heard these slogans. We might be dating ourselves a little bit here, but most of us have heard these slogans. Um, Let's begin with this one. No no rules, just right. Do we know where that came from? Really? Outback. If you guessed Outback Steakhouse, you'd be correct. What about this one? Have it your way. Burger King. Hold the pickles, hold the lettuce, special orders, don't upset it. Burger King. Burger King, right. Finally, no shirt, no shoes, no service. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Welcome, Mike. <laughs> well, the first two obviously were successful themes for a steak and hamburger chains, but the third, well, you might see that on a restaurant door, but that's not wasn't on any of your commercials, was it? No, no. But why are the advertisements so popular? Well, because we all like the thought of having things our way. We want to be our own boss, and we don't care at all to have somebody else telling us what we can and cannot do. Just think of the national uh, division uh, over COVID and mask uh, mandates. But advertising, advertising is geared to selling us exactly what we want. Now, that may be a, a bit frivolous, but there is a point here. We all have problems with authority. Even whether we like to admit it or not, with God's authority. It's been that way since the beginning of time. Remember in the Garden of Eden, as Adam and Eve are pondering why God would not let them eat of the fruit of the tree. They suspected that God was holding out on them. Not letting them have what they really wanted or really needed. And Satan uses this thought against them. 
But the serpent said to the woman, Surely you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. In our text this morning, we find that that man's problem with God's authority has been simmering. This morning's interaction between Jesus and the scribes and the priests is taking place on on Tuesday of the Holy Week. And in the next few days, or in the case of the church calendar, in the next two weeks, the problem is going to boil over into the crucifixion of God's own Son, Jesus Christ. You see, the natural perception of sinners is that God's authority prevents them from getting what they want. Let's look at this morning's reading from Luke, at what is often called the parable of the wicked tenants, for just a few moments. As we've talked about, first of all, it's very important to determine who Jesus is talking to. And in this case, we read in verse 1, one day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and scribes came up. So in this parable, who's Jesus speaking to? He's speaking to the people in the temple. The true, the scribes and Pharisees, they're listening in. But this parable is given to the people, and it is a warning to them about the religious leaders. And key to understanding this parable is knowing that when vineyards are spoken about in the scriptures, it's often in relation to the nation of Israel. God called them his vineyard. He's the vine, they're the branches. The vineyard in this parable belongs to the the master, but he's given stewardship of the land over to the tenants, right? The master and the tenants had made a business deal. The master gives the tenants the ability to plant crops on his land, and in return, he gets rent for the property. That rent is simply to give the master a portion of the fruits that they produced. The master doesn't live anywhere near the land, but trusts that the tenants will stick to their end of the bargain. The tenants in this in Jesus' parable of the vineyard decide that they're the master's authority over his vineyard It stands in the way of them having it for themselves, keeping the fruits for themselves. Now, people look at this and might seem a little foreign to them, but that kind of a transaction at the time was not unheard of. It took place all the time, and it's not unheard of today. Uh, Jolene has this sort of a a relationship involving land her family's owned since the Kansas land rush of the 1800s. Relatives farm the land that she owns, and they pay her with a portion of the harvest. But in the parable, the tenants have determined that they no longer want to honor their deal. They want the land for themselves. They want the fruit for themselves. And so they question the owner's right to the land and the crops. And this master is, is clearly God. The tenants are the religious leaders of Israel. Now, in the book of Luke... Jesus' own authority has been questioned throughout the book. You may recall in Luke chapter 5, verses 17 to 26, where Jesus heals the paralytic man who had been lowered through the roof of the building he was in, lowered through the roof by some friends. And Jesus says, man, your spirits are, or your sins are forgiven you. And the Pharisees fire back at them, who is this that speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? In chapter 6, 1 through 11, they challenged Jesus for allowing his hungry disciples to pick some heads of grain and, and to rub them together in their hands in violation of their understanding of the Sabbath. And then in chapters 11 through 16, we find Jesus sharing many more parables, just like we have, against these religious leaders, against their understanding that the law saves, and against their understanding that do what I say not as I do. On this Holy Tuesday, or this week, Holy Tuesday and Holy Week, things are coming now to a head. The leaders questioned his authority to preach and teach in verses 1 through 8. In verses 20 through 26, they sought to trap Jesus in his own words when, as they asked, is it lawful for us to pay tribute to Caesar or not? 
that Jesus publicly denounces the scribes in verses 45 and 47. These things rile up the religious leaders, directly leading to the events which Jesus is foretelling in this morning's parable. See, in this parable, the tenants even challenge the authority of the delegates of the master. These servants sent by the masters in verses 10 through 12 represent the many, many prophets that God had sent to the people throughout the ages. And history tells us that being a prophet of God was not a proper popular calling. Elijah, greatest of prophets, had a death sentence on his head. Church tradition tells us that the prophet Isaiah was sawn in two. Jeremiah was threatened with death. Zechariah was killed by stoning. And we've all heard of John the Baptist, last and greatest of the Old, time, uh, Old Testament uh, prophets, and he was beheaded. Each of these prophets was sent by God was ultimately rejected by the people of Israel. And despite the, his, uh, the attacks on his servants, we find that the owner doesn't give up. He, he sends his son to the tenants. And the owner's son in verses 13 to 15 is quite clearly representing God's only begotten son, Jesus Christ. The irony of Jesus t telling the tenants of the treatment of the master's son is that God's own tenants, the people of Israel, the religious leaders of that time, would in the same manner lead Jesus from the city of Jerusalem, marching up the hill to Calvary where he would be killed on a cross for their sins and for ours. Like the evil tenants, incredibly, they believe that, that this killing will cast off God's authority and make them their own masters. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you, God's own holy priesthood, have, have problems with God's authority as well. First of all, as you follow Jesus, you will be challenged by those who despise God's authority. And therefore, they challenge your faith. And this whole world system is arraigned against us, making what is evil seem normal or even good. Sexual immorality of all sorts, spoken against clearly in the scriptures, now considered normal, even for Christians. Of all the weddings that I've officiated in, only in one instance were the Christian couples not living together beforehand. It's now considered normal. Uh, they, when asked about, about it, they said, well, this is, this is what you do to find out if you're compatible. You have to do this. To preach against it is seen as old-fashioned, <clears throat> out of touch. It earns mockery. Today, Hollywood and in its entertainment and the corporate world and its commercials uses its own influence to mock those who dare stand against their own worldly views. This world will tell you that there are many ways to heaven, that it's intolerant to speak otherwise. Each person has the right to believe that their own chosen path is the right path, that all religions are valid if you only believe in them deeply enough. But what does Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The world, brothers and sisters, hates these words. You yourself challenge God's authority, spurred sometimes by your own sinful nature, operating in cahoots with the world. There, there are things that we want that we think that God is holding back from us. The, the first example that came to my mind as I was thinking of this is come, concerns God's forgiveness. This is the work of the devil. Satan would have you believe that God's forgiveness is not for you. That you're too horrible of a person. That God could not possibly forgive your sins. They're too great. They're too dark. If God only knew what I'd done, he could never forgive me. Or this world will tell you that there is no sin, that there are only lifestyles and choices. Some Christians have fallen for this lie hook, line, and sinker. 
as we or in many, several instances as our children walk in some sinful uh, lifestyle, we will question God's authority to call their living arrangements sin. We think that God must make exceptions for us or for our loved ones and our choices of lifestyles. After all, they say, God made me this way. He wants just for me to be happy, right? But the reality is that those who remain stubbornly opposed to God's authority will indeed receive no good news. In fact, all that they have will be taken away. In this parable, Jesus tells of the death of the Son, his own death, but gives no indication in this of the resurrection, does he? These same Jewish leaders, when faced with Jesus' resurrection on that first Easter morning, they will see it only as bad news. Jesus quotes from Psalm 118, and it is somewhat cryptic, I might add, that when, what then does this scripture mean that stone has, that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? Well, for those who reject Jesus, it is not good news. All those in this world who continue to oppose God's authority, including the mission he's designated for his son, will also lose everything. When Easter morning comes here in a couple of weeks, there will be no celebration for those who really wish that Jesus was dead, that he had stayed dead. Hear the words of Jesus in Mark 16, 16. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. You see, each of us must deal with that stone that was rejected but has become the cornerstone. All of us who believe in Christ must at some time in our lives fall into the, into the brokenness of repentance so that we might be raised again as new creations, living stones in Christ, the temple of God. But upon unbelievers comes the crushing blow of judgment. So do we repent of challenging God's authority for sin or will we be crushed? How does God, in fact, desire us to see his authority over us? We have just looked at what the world believes. But how does God desire? Jesus' enemies, had, they had long ago forgotten that they were merely stewards over God's land and over his people. They had forgotten about God's authority over them. The master had planted the vineyard and trusted it to their care a millennia before. God had been used using and blessing Israel all along throughout the exodus, throughout their exile in Babylon, in fact, throughout their entire history. He even sent the prophets to remind them of his love and of his promises for them. Again and again, he sent the prophets. And how did the people respond? They abused the prophets. Even so, God remained faithful to his promise. And finally, God sent his only begotten son to them. Even after each of the prophets who had been sent to call the people to repent it had been mistreated, they'd been abused, they'd been mocked, and in some cases they'd been killed. Christ himself, though he was sinless, suffered and died for these mockers and for us. Yet in this parable, Jesus reminds the religious leaders that if they did not repent, then he would give the vineyard to others. It is still God's desire, brothers and sisters, to use his authority to give. God has now given the vineyard to his church, to you and to me, and to all who believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Christ died for the, all of the times even we have challenged God's authority, but he has risen. Because he has risen, we have assurances that our sins are forgiven, no matter how great, no matter how dark. Jesus went to the cross for those sins as well. Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, God holds no good thing back from us. Though through the sinless life and death and resurrection of Jesus, God freely gives us his forgiveness. God freely gives us salvation. God freely gives us eternal life. God wants us to understand that this is how he always wishes to exercise his authority. 
The Father and the Son desire us to see their authority as not from withholding from us, but as giving abundantly. Jesus even tells us, I came that they might have life and might have it more abundantly. So hear the word of the Lord. Fear not, little flock, Jesus says, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you, not just the vineyard, but the kingdom. Giving is his style. Brothers and sisters in Christ, these are God's promises given for you and fulfilled in Jesus. Amen. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace.